Yeah, so we're going to we're going to talk about AI considerations and how and how some of the AI technology today is impacting businesses um, in a transformative way, not just an incremental way. So <clears throat> experts are likening, you know, what's happening with in particular generative AI today um, as being, you know, the foundation for what where they're calling the fifth industrial resolution or revolution, excuse me. <clears throat> the first being coal back in the 1700s, gas in the late 1800s, electronics and nuclear energy, uh, 1969. The fourth one, they consider the internet and renewable energy around the year 2000. And now they're saying this is the fifth industrial revolution. Um, so as AI continues to evolve, you know, and, and permeate our lives um, with all these assistants and other things, um, it is ushering in transformative changes and creating immense possibilities, both for individuals and companies. So, you know, it is poised to reshape indust industries, economies, and societies. And like I mentioned, not just in incremental ways, but in profound ways. So it's going to be transformative and hopefully, you know, all, all research so far is pointing to that's going to drive tremendous efficiency, improve customer experiences and groundbreaking advancements in things like the personalized medicine, um, which impacts most of us in healthcare. So I'm going to cover agenda at a real high level what's AI, how is it transformative to business? I want to spend a little bit of time on the risks with AI and then talk about governance behind it. So AI, AI has been around a really long time. Um, AI is not a new concept, um, but some of the capabilities that are now available didn't exist um, until recently. So you know, artificial is or artificial intelligence is kind of the umbrella term, and within that is machine learning. And machine learning isn't new either. Um, but within machine learning, there are other types of areas that are now developing more. So machine learning itself, um, they describe as teaching computers how to make predictions based on data, right? So you feed it data it's able to analyze it and make predictions on the data. If we look at deep learning, that green box that kind of crosses multiple boxes, um, that is a family within machine learning um, based on what we call artificial neuron networks or neural networks. And often these networks are trained with synthetic data, meaning you know, for, when it comes to machine learning, you have you have to provide a tremendous amount of data for the system to learn, right? Or understand what's normal, so that when you give it a parameter, it can predict the other parameters um, based on what it gleaned from all that data. Um, deep learning, you know, I mean, it takes a tremendous amount of data to feed these artificial neural networks. And, and I liken this back to, you know, when I was in graduate school, I got my master's and I remember taking a course in numerical analysis and we would go through and do like eight or nine or 10th um, degree polynomials, right, to make predictions on things. And if you think about that kind of a concept, if you think about mathematical formulas and maybe having something to the 10th power, Right, consider deep learning and these artificial neural networks as having thousands of degrees. And back when I went through school, you know, computers just couldn't handle that, right? It was a great idea. You know, the concepts behind deep learning have existed for a long time, but we didn't have the computing power that could actually do it. And that's what's really changed now, is now we have computers that are powerful enough to perform this deep learning, and now we're seeing the results of it. So natural language processing, um, again, has been around a long time. Think of your Google Assistant or your Alexa, 
um, or your chat bots, right, that can take a, an audio stream um, and be able to interpret that and, you know, potentially com communicate back to you in the same way. Um, so that's all, everything related to the interactions between humans and computers. Now, computer vision also been around a while, right? Trains machines to understand and interpret the visual world. So think about object rec recognition, right? Think about something like Instagram, where it'll it might pop up and say, "Hey, I recognize. Do you want to tag this person?" You know, it's using facial recognition to identify and connect that to other people. And within, um, oh, sorry. So computer vision has everything to do with, with images. And when you combine that with deep learning, we're now getting the ability to create art um, and create objects, um, which is both amazing and what it can do, but scary at the same time. And you've heard people mention deep fakes, um, and that's where that comes in, um, is the combination of some of these technologies. So the, the pink box here is reinforcement learning. Now, in AI, there's, you know, if you think about it at a high level, you could bucket learning algorithms into three buckets, supervised learning. So think about, you know, providing a computer thousands of pictures of dogs and cats <clears throat> so that it can learn to tell the difference if you give it a photo, is that a dog or a cat? Um, so you're, you have predefined outcomes, you know, you're feeding it to the computer to learn. Unsupervised learning is giving, you know, giving the computer a bunch of data and having it try and distinguish whether it's categories, whether it's natural groupings, things like that. So you don't know exactly what you're looking for, but you're using the computer to help figure that out. And some of this is used in cybersecurity today in finding anomalies in data, right? So it knows what normal processing looks like. So if it sees something falling into a different category or something that doesn't fit into existing groupings, it'll flag that as an anomaly to look at. And then there's this concept of reinforcement learning. And that is um, teaching a computer to think, I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this, teaching a computer to think like a human or to not, not necessarily think as a human, how about learn as a human? So if you think about when you were a child, <clears throat> you know, you, you would walk around the house and if you ran into a wall, right, you'd learn, okay, well, I can't walk that way anymore, right? You get up and try again and you move through a doorway or, you know, you touch something hot and you get that immediate negative feedback, right? And so you learn not to do things. And so you're really getting like in the actions you take day in and day out, all day, every day, you're getting positive and negative feedback on what works and what doesn't, right? Or what's, you know, what's good and what's bad. And this is the same type of thing when we refer to reinforcement learning with computers. So it's self-learning with no guidance you're not giving them guidance and it's getting feedback like success or failure. So, um, you know, you, you tell it what you want it to do, but you don't tell it how, and it figures that out on its, on its own. And I've got a clip here in a minute, I'm going to show, um, which is a pretty, pretty remarkable, pretty remarkable, remarkable event that happened. Um, in terms of computer-based reinforcement learning. And then robotics, I kind of have at the edge. <clears throat> robotics is where artificial intelligence connects with the physical world. So in this realm, think of, I mean, physical robots, right? If they're performing tasks, think of it as self-driving vehicles, right? So it's not just doing the computations, it's actually controlling the physical object. Um, and so that's why that one kind of falls outside of artificial artificial intelligence to to a degree 
because it's not just the computer-based information, it's also intersecting with the physical world. So, well, let's see, did I get these, let me see, did I get these out of sequence? Where'd my article go? Oh, okay. Apologies, like I said, this is my first time presenting this deck. Um, so that clip will come up a few slides, a few slides later. So that's artificial intelligence. So why do we hear so much right now about generative AI? Well, generative AI combines natural language processing, which we just talked about. So recognizing either written text or verbal text and deep learning to derive or generate new content. And that content can be in the form of text, images, audio, video. Um, it can be any of a number of things. And so, you know, this, this is really driving some of that transformation. And I mentioned there, right, it's the fastest growing, highest potential, and most threatening innovation today, not necessarily in a security way, um, you know, some are concerned about job security. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of potential, but with potential comes responsibility. And so, you know, this, this is transformative because it's now creating content. And, you know, you can use it to write an article, you can use it to proofread a paper, you can, I mean, you can do all kinds of things with it. So some of the major players out there that are getting a lot of press in terms of generative AI, obviously chat GPT. It, it's hard to have, have a day go by where I'm not hearing something about chat GPT. And chat GPT, you know, GPT is the large language model. Um, so there's more than just chat GPT, but chat GPT is open AI, arguably the most advanced um, chat functionality that's out there. Um, you've got GitHub Copilot. So this is a, um, a a chat bot, basically, right? Like a chat GPT that will write code for you. Um, so they've integrated, Microsoft's integrated it into GitHub. So you can say, hey, I need code, you know, I need a function to do this and I want it done in this language and it'll spit out code for you. Um, not sure, I mean, I haven't used this personally because I haven't written code in forever, but um, not sure how advanced this is, but I gotta believe it's pretty impressive. Um, BARD is Google's answer to ChatGPT and Microsoft's. Um, so that's Google's chat engine. Um, the diagram to the right of that is the, the logo for Microsoft Copilot. So Copilot's their AI initiatives that they're now trying to integrate into things like Bing Search and Edge and Microsoft 365. Um, as I understand, it's going to come up out eventually as a separately priced option, but um, that is their, their realm of AI. Then you've got AWS Code Whisperer is a competitor to GitHub Copilot. <laughs> so that's the way to write code in AWS um, using a, a chat bot. And Midjourney and Dolly 2 are both um, generative AI applications, but these are applications for images. So you can go to Midjourney and or Dolly and describe an image that you want it to create, and it'll create that image for you. <clears throat> so it's pretty amazing. Um, some of these are free. Chat GPT you can use for three or free at least the 3.5 version. Bard you can use for free. You know, if you pull up Edge, there's a Copilot extension that you can open and use some of it that way. You know, Dolly and Midjourney cost money. You know, if you want the latest and greatest Chat GPT, which is 4.0. You know, that costs 20 bucks a month. Um, but, you know, huge, huge, enormous potential. And so what I really wanted to point out here was, 
you know, some of its capabilities. <clears throat> now, in terms of a product, you know, Chat GPT is owned and run by OpenAI, which is um, a collaboration of many companies. Um, and I think Microsoft and probably Google, I think, are investors in OpenAI, right? So they're all contributing to this. But look at the, on this chart, look at how quickly chat GPT, you know, permeated the business world or permeated just the world in general. So if we look back at some of these other technologies, you know, 2008 Spotify came out. It took them 11 years to get to 100 million users. You know, Netflix, 10 years, Airbnb, eight, Twitter, five, Facebook, four and a half, you know, come up to some of the newer things, 2010, Instagram, two and a half years to get to 100 million. TikTok in 2016 got to 100 million users in less than a year, in nine months. And ChatGPT came out in late 2022, and they had 100 million users in two months. I mean, that's just staggering for me to imagine, right? How, how you could get that kind of adoption and that speed. And, and I understand some of this adoption has to do with other technology as well, right? The ones that we're comparing to, the most recent one was from 2016. So that's seven years ago. So technology has certainly evolved since then. You know, social media has evolved since then. And so just the technology alone is going to allow company to, you know, come to faster adoption. But this is still this is still staggering to get 100 million users in two months. So, <clears throat> so to show you what, you know, give you an example of the, the capability that you can get out of a, out of chat GPT. And that's the one I use. Um, I, I gave it a prompt and I said, okay, here's, here's a security problem for you. Um, you know, I want you to, I want you to respond to me like you're a cybersecurity specialist. Um, I want you to propose strategies for solving a problem. And the first problem I want you to solve is I need help developing an information. And uh, let me read this. So my exact request was I need help developing an effective cybersecurity strategy to prevent staff from saving company data to USB drives, right? So something we've all dealt with, right? Data loss prevention, trying to keep people from stealing company data. So I gave ChatGPT this prompt. I used ChatGPT4. So I finally bit the bullet and said, this is so amazing. I want the latest and greatest. So I paid the 20 bucks a month and I'm using GPT4, but <clears throat> look at the look at what it spit out as a response to me. All right. First of all, it's addressing me formally. Understood, Doug, to develop a cybersecurity strategy, right? You'll need to consider a combination of technical controls, policies, and employee awareness programs. Here are key strategies to implement. And it gave me 10 different strategies on how to tackle this from USB port control. DLP tools, encryption, policy, you know, audits and monitoring, training and awareness, um, physical security, patch management. I mean, this is this is a really well thought out response, right? This is a, this is a response that I would have I would expect from a cybersecurity manager who's been in the business ten years. So for me to just give it this prompt and have it spit this back. I find pretty amazing, pretty impressive. Com comments from anyone on this? Do you find this as interesting as me or is this? I do. Go ahead. Anybody else? <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree, especially the two months part that blew my mind. Uh -huh. <laughs> And this is so complex, yeah. this this strategy and this plan. Um, <clears throat> where do they get the, inf yeah. are you sharing where they get the information? Are they just searching for it? Well, so I'll probably get to that okay. later in the deck. Great, thank um, you. Because that's, that's part of the risk yeah. um, is, 
you know, how much, you know, where is the data coming from and how much do you trust the data that it's giving you back? Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. So I want to show you the clip because the clip um, also demonstrates the capability. So let me, I, I'll go ahead and play the clip. Um, I think I have to stop presenting momentarily. And I'll bring in this window. <clears throat> and I'll play, I'm only going to play part of this clip, but hopefully the sound will come through. At the game. But even yes. more important than AlphaGo's win was one moment during the game, the moment that caused Lee Sedol to leave the room. So to pause for a moment, Lee Sedol is looked at um, in, the, in this game of Go, you know, which is a kind of simple but complex game from a strategy perspective. He's the he's looked at as the world renowned leader or or best player in the world at this game. And they put him up against AlphaGo, which was a Google AI engine. AlphaGo played this move, which I want to hear more about in a second, but uh, Lee has left the room. He left the room after that. He left that the room move. after that move. It was a move that seemed terrible to everyone who saw it, but it turned out that move 37 was an incredible move to play, and it was instrumental in helping AlphaGo win the game. Somehow, a computer program knew something about the game that we didn't. Somehow, its intuition was both different and better than human intuition. One of the players, Fan Hui, said, it's not a human move. I've never seen a human play this move. So beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. AI thinks you're beautiful too, Fan. Move 37 offered us a glimpse of what an intelligence looks like that thinks differently than we do, but is still very much capable of accomplishing tasks. Interestingly, Lee... So I'll stop that there. <clears throat> you know, there was, there was a lot of doubt you know, by by this player that a computer could look not just I, I mean that a computer could learn this game because it was so um, complex. Sorry, I'm trying, just trying to get to the right slide. Um, and, you know, not only did the computer learn, I think it beat him four out of five games that he played the computer. Um, and, you know, you see this. I, I mean, this really impacted him. He's sitting on the right. Um, I mean, you can see when the computer made that move, he got up and left. And I think, uh, I, you know, I can only guess that was frustration because as you heard the commentator in the video say, this was a ridiculous move, right? No, no human would ever make that move. Um, but yet the, the, you know, AlphaGo did make that move and ended up winning the game. And, you know, it demonstrates what AlphaGo was doing with what we call reinforcement learning, right? So it knew the objective was to win the game and it was trying millions and millions of possibilities of how to get there. And obviously in its analysis at some point, it said, I need a, you know, I need one of these pegs in that specific position. So even, you know, it's thinking well in advance of, you know, the next five or 10 moves and um, it helped it win the game. So, you know, that that player came back and said, you know, I really doubted that AI could, you know, could provide this level of analysis to be able to beat me at this game. And he said, when it made that move, it convinced me that it could. Again, because that's not, that that's a move that a human would have never taken. Okay, so let's look at how generative AI is transforming industries. So I, I give eight examples here, and then I, I I'll go into a bunch specific to healthcare. So if in the financial services industry, you know, it can be used to engage um, or create engaging customer collateral. So think of this from a marketing perspective. Um, you can also use it to collect and aggregate data to give them insights on behaviors. Um, retail, again, engaging high quality marketing, uh, manufacturing, you can use it in product design, um, like the image generation that I, 
I referred to, you can tell it, hey, you know, design me a part with these characteristics, right? And it can generate that and send it to you. Not the part, obviously, but the image of the part. Um, you know, in government, you know, it's and, and it's not just government. I mean, chatbots. Chatbots have exploded, and ChatGPT is is one of them. Um, but you know, I think about my Alexa and my Google Assistant, which I use all the time at home. Um, and this is just taking all that to another level. In healthcare, you know, one of the things it can do, right, is being used as conversational pa patient assistance. Um, but there's numerous other ones I'll get to in a minute. Utilities, it can analyze usage patterns, segment customers, um, you know, target new offerings, help manage the grids better, um, a number of different things there. Education, it can create lesson plans for you. I know in one of the examples in chat GPT, just from a personal level, you can say, hey, you know, here's my, you know, here's my height, weight, here's what I like to do, you know, develop a workout strategy for the next month and it'll spit one back at you. <clears throat> and an insurance, right, helps with, with claims, right? Looking at claims data, helping them price insurance, helping them, um, you know, manage, you know, for for the large losses, which are the, the major events when it comes to insurance. Specifically in healthcare, these are these are ones that I've seen or read about that are being used. Probably the most, um, what I would say is the most transformational, I think, is this first one, radiology reads and cancer detection. You know, they, they've proven in some of these, um, some of these large language models that they've used, that they can detect cancer quicker and uh, sooner with AI than they can with human radiologists. And, you know, that's, you know, as, as we talk about the risks, right, the the physicians and the, radi the radiologists who read these are very leery about this, you know, and that's some of the, some of the challenge in working through these technologies because they're saying, hey, how can it possibly pick that up? And they're not necessarily trusting it. You know, maybe it's right, maybe it's not right. Um, but I think Harvard did a study and they said, if you combine the radiologist with, you know, the AI technology, you get like a 99% detection. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of possibility to, to detect things much sooner than we could in the past. And I know a lot of the medical device companies are working to try and figure out how to integrate this into their products. So clinical decision decision support along the same lines. Um, virtual telemedicine assistance. So think of a chat bot that's from your doctor's office, right? That can look at your record and provide guidance um, and then involve a, a, you know, a doctor or nurse when necessary. Um, it can be used in medication management, streamlining documentation and coding. Um, you know, improving revenue cycle management, which is always an important area for hospitals, um, facilitating real-time eligibility verification, workflows, um, you know, from a marketing and communications, I think we had some examples of that. Audit and compliance can, can use it for access monitoring, right? Um, so to look for those abnormalities in people accessing PHI to find something that may not be legitimate. Um, and so you see other, other examples here. There's a bunch of stuff you can do in research, um, in HR, as far as resume screening and picking applicants, um, lo lots of potential opportunities. So let's talk about the risks a little bit. Um, and, I, and I'm just going to sit on this slide for, for a little bit because there's a lot that can be said for these eight boxes. So one of the one of the big concerns is data privacy risk. And it gets to the question that Terry asked earlier, which is where did it get its data that it's training on? 
you know, did it scrape it from the internet, right? Did did somebody provide it my medical records? Um, you know, is somebody providing my information on, you know, where I live or, you know, the sites that I'm visiting on, in my browser? You know, where where is that data coming from? <clears throat> and, you know, the short answer for for you and I who are using these tools, there's not an easy way to know that. You know, the, there is ethical responsibilities and privacy restrictions that companies have to employ, but you and I as consumers have no way to verify whether they're actually following those or not. Um, another big concern is AI bias. So, you know, we may take our, you know, I, I, I'm the, I, I help a company that's a, software or a healthcare data analytics company and they use models to basically predict things like you know if this patient's seen in the emergency department for this issue um, what's the likelihood that they're going to be back in the emergency room in the next 30 days or what's the what's the likelihood that they're going to pass away in the next 90 days um, and so it uses predictive analytics to do stuff like that to help the health system, you know, provide better care um, for that patient. Um, but one of the big concerns in that kind of a model is the bias, because in order to come up with those predictions, you have to give it a lot of data. And so, you know, this company typically will go, go to their customer and say, give me three years of your EHR data, right? Every, every record, everything, right? They'll de-identify it, but you know, that, that set of data is gonna be biased to the characteristics of the population, right? Where, where they live, the climate that they live in, the, you know, the wealth of the areas that they live in, um, there's a lot of things that can bias that data. And so if you're going to use that data to predict something from somebody in a very different geography, say, that model might, might not be good. You know, it might not give positive results for a different geography or a different population. And so this is spinning up a whole nother field um, around, you know, people learning how to detect and how to validate and how to audit the bias in AI models. Um, along those same lines, there's a concern about false information. So <laughs> there's even a term for this in AI and it's called a hallucination. So you feed it all this data, you ask it a question, it spits out a response, but there's no guarantee that that response is gonna be factually accurate. Right, it's using all of its data that it knows, but it's also trying to interpret that in the, its response back to you. And so, there's absolutely a validation step that needs to be done, and probably in more of a continuous mode, to validate the output of these models to make sure they remain accurate. And ChatGPT is pretty good because you can say, you know, I want you to produce this, and I want you to give me. Um, oh, I'm blanking on the term, um, footnotes and references of where, you know, where some of the data came from or where I can go research more. And it will do that. It will give you references. <clears throat> um, reputational damage. So back, I mean, along the same lines of what we've been talking about, not knowing where this data is coming from, um, you know, companies can get blamed to say, hey, this spit out data that, you know, only you as a company knew, or or maybe we're using a, you know, a chat bot in our hospital for something or, or a scheduling function or something, and it does, did something wrong, right? It was directing people or giving people bad advice or telling them to do something we didn't want them doing. And that creates reputational damage for the company because um, people are going to say, you know, you guys look silly. You're you're telling me things or you caused me harm and I'm not coming back to you again. So reputational damage is a concern. Adversarial attacks. So, you know, we like to think that people only use 
this kind of technology for good? Not always true. Um, so, you know, there's plenty of attackers out there, and I guarantee they're using these technologies to come up with ways to penetrate somebody's network. So you can ask it to write code. I'm sure you could probably get it to write ransomware code too, right, if you asked it. Um, legal liability, just a broad term, um, but I'll touch on the other remaining two going around the, the circle here, loss of intellectual property. So I was on a call last week with a company that said, hey, we deployed this AI thing and we write a lot of code. And obviously, you know, it was given data to help um, learn. And somehow our, you know, our custom code was given to it as part of that model. And now that model is public or available to other companies. So we somehow got our intellectual property embedded in the learning of that model. And there's no good way to get that back at this point because the, you know, the model's already learned based on it. <clears throat> and, the, and on the flip side of that, if you think about it from the perspective of a company using code that's outputted from something like, you know, Microsoft's GitHub Copilot. So you go in there and say, hey, I need, you know, I need a function that does this and I, you know, I want it written in Python and it, it comes back and spits it out and you go ahead and use it in your product or in your application that you're building, but you have no idea where that code came from. And so you don't know if, you know, the code that it pulled and the, that it gave you to use is actually copyrighted. And there's, you know, there's some questions on the imaging side or some lawsuits going on right now from companies like Getty Images, which is like a huge image company, right? That, you know, like, let's think of like, like stock photos. Um, so they're huge into that space and they're saying, hey, you know, you went out and told this to learn, <clears throat> you know, we think you, you know, you were surfing our results on Google right and and it's pulling up all these images and it's using our images in its learning and so the images it's creating is based on our content and therefore you violated our copyright so unsure exactly how that one's going to play out um, in the media or in the you know the legal realm but um, you know that certainly is another risk that you need to consider okay so you know, from a policy perspective, as we, th we think about policy and governance around AI, you know, companies are inconsistent and, and it's because it's such a new and fast evolving space, right? I think to, to think about AI and say, you know, well, I don't have to worry about it yet because people in my company aren't using it, I think is naive. I mean, this is out there and publicly available. And I don't know that many companies have even thought about trying to block it or whether they even want to block it, right? Because there's tremendous opportunity in it. But there's also, you know, as we've seen on the last slide, a decent amount of risk that you need to be concerned about. So we've got a number of companies that straight out prohibit it, right? You see some of your big banks there. Um, some allow particular things to to be used. Um, I, I think CNET was one of those I've seen that actually uses it to write their articles, right, um, that you go read on their website. Um, so that's pretty interesting. Um, some companies, Amazon, Walmart, Microsoft, <clears throat> allow you to use it as long as you don't, you know, use any company data with it, right, which might be a more reasonable approach and then some companies are just like, hey, if my company can, you know, if my users can find benefit out of it, more power to them, go, you know, go off and figure out what you can do. Um, so obviously companies like Google, um, as well as some of these big consulting companies are are all in with it, you know, and letting them, letting the staff figure out the best way to leverage this. In terms of how to govern AI, um, there's four four main areas that I think that I recommend people do when they're trying to tackle this. Um, and I'm working working on these right now with Atlantic Care. 
And, you know, first off is policy. And, and I will say it's, you know, I find this kind of ironic because I can go to chat GPT and say, produce me an AI policy and it will. So <laughs> it's, it's writing its own policy. Um, but hey, you know, if it's gonna help, if it's gonna improve workflow, get you a faster result, you know, it's probably a good thing. Um, as we talked about the risks, right? There's ethics and guiding principles. And these are not just things that the industry or the company will put out, but there's a lot of concern globally from governments around the world in the, you know, the safe and responsible use of AI. And so, you know, you can go to the EU and they have guidance, you know, you'll see a link on a, on a page with references here, you know, NIST has an AI risk management framework. Um, and there's even AI.gov now, um, where the federal governments talk about responsible use of AI. So ethics and guiding principles are definitely something that you have to focus on and make sure people are educated on so that it's not abused. Oversight and prioritization. So this is getting a grasp on what's already going on in your environment, um, but also looking at opportunities and prioritizing them based on you know, value to the business, based on risk of the platform and what they're trying to do, um, but really providing that oversight and prioritization of initiatives around AI in your company. And then have a roadmap. You know, in the absence of a roadmap, people are just going to make up their own. Um, and so better to, you know, to have a group focused on this and publish something to at least try and guide the investigation, the education, the initiatives for your company in a particular direction. So things that you want to include also, which I look at as contributors to success, are staff education, first of all. I mean, this space is evolving so fast. Um, people have to be educated. You know, you don't want to just leave it to them going out and trying to figure it out on their own or just making decisions in a vacuum and making decisions about policy when they don't even know what the product is or haven't even seen what it can do. So education is a, is a key contributor to success. Data governance is also an area that's very closely tied to AI. Um, as you can imagine from the risk slide that that we displayed, because you don't know where the data is coming from, um, you want to be able to control what you know what's being used to train the engine, and also you know validate if it's producing data. You know where who's responsible for that? Where is it going to be stored? Um, you know who who owns it officially? Is it the company? Is it public information? So the whole concept of data governance fits in very closely with artificial intelligence. And it's one that a lot of companies, in my experience, don't do well. Um, and that's data governance. So um, also steering committee contributor to success. So get a cross-functional group together. You know, have, have legal, have HR, have your innovation folks. Um, you know, and your key stakeholders, right? If you've got people in the organization tagged with being responsible for leading innovation, they absolutely need to be in this too. But um, great idea to have that steering committee be cross-functional and also being that group that provides that prioritization for the organization so that you don't end up trying to go in 12 different directions. As staffing permits, you could stand up a center of excellence. So these are people probably more on the on the business and tech side um, that are really leading edge thinkers in being able to take advantage of the technology, either from a business perspective or a technology perspective. Um, and so this would be a small group of people that do this this type of activity day in day out. But many organizations like ours, right? We don't we don't have um, I would say the the staffing to be able to stand up a separate center of excellence, but it's just something that we're still going to have to consider. And then lastly, I guess this ties with, with education, but staying current on new advancements because it is such a fast moving 
moving um, area. Um, even in the, the last six months, there's been tremendous advancements. And, and I think what's really making it transformative as a technology, this generative AI, it's, it's not looking at one thing like image recognition or, you know, just, you know, how it's applied to chat bots. Where it's really become transformative is you have chat or you have these AI engines feeding other engines. And so what I see in the image creation space is people will go to chat GPT to help them construct the most useful prompt to get the result that they want out of the image engine. And so they're using one, one engine to feed a different engine. And so you're, you're compounding the, the potential possibilities and transformative opportunities by, um, you know, having these these AI engines leverage each other. So, so I put some references here on the slide, um, and I can provide. I mean, I mean, Terry, I, I can send you this deck. Um, okay. Obviously, these are hyperlinks which you can't mm -hmm. see, but you can at least Google them, right? NIST has an AI resource center with lots of information. Um, they also have a, an AI risk management framework. Um, on the ethics side, there's a couple of good documents. The World Economic Forum put one out, um, as well as the European Commission. Um, so if you really want to understand some of the thoughts around ethical use of AI, um, those are good things to read. And from an education standpoint, I, I mean, obviously, or, or I shouldn't say obviously, but um, there's a tremendous amount of information out there. It's hard for me to go a day, if not half a day, without hearing AI. And if you go out to YouTube, um, they've got videos you can watch. I've done and gone through some stuff that LinkedIn has on the LinkedIn learning platform. They're very good. And then we also have a subscription to Udemy Business, and they have a whole plethora of courses available. So it's, you know, it's really kind of drinking from the fire hose at this point. There is so much education information out there. The hard part is trying to figure out what you want to take. Um, so those are references. Um, you know, I encourage you, if you haven't played with it already, go ahead and do it. Um, you know, ChatGPT is free. You know, there may be pockets in your organization that are using it already that you don't know about or vendors that are that have embedded some of this capability into their products that maybe you don't know about. Um, so certainly go out and explore, understand what this capability is, what it can do, and think about how it can best benefit your organization because there are a tremendous amount of opportunities um, along with you know, the negative aspects um, and the risks involved. So, like I said at the very beginning, you know, experts are looking at this as the fifth industrial revolution because it is it is so transformative in what it can do and the and the things that it can provide to companies. So on the left here, this is one of my favorite sayings. I got a poster on my wall that says this, you know, the best way to predict the future is to create it. So I don't always live by that, but I always tell myself I try to. And that's all I've got.